zoom out again and we're going to hear from some of the progressive voices so hopefully there'll be a little bit more cheer in the room there will be progressive voices from the trade union movement uh, from progressive business from uh, a member state and from youth and young people if we have to have some hope from somewhere, let's hope that it comes from the young people. So I'm going to ask, first of all, for uh, Jan Notterdam, who's the co-founder of CSR Europe, which is the trade association representing European business who commit to corporate social responsibility, uh, to come and join me on stage. Thank you, Jan. And it's a network, for those of you who don't know, which has 100 corporate members and national partner organizations, and it engages with about 10,000 entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we all have also have Montserrat Mir, who is the Confederal Secretary for the European Trade Union Confederation. And Montserrat has a very big portfolio, climate, sustainable development, corporate social responsibility, and gender equality. <coughs> and uh, previously, you were very active in the International Trade Union Confederation and the Spanish Postal Service. So Montserrat, thank you for joining us. And please, Laura Martin Murillo, please come on stage for the next panel. The advisor on employment and just transition from this new ministry for the ecological transition of Spain and has been very, very involved working with trade unions on the green agenda for many, many years. Anne Rudigreen, who's the Secretary General of the European Youth Forum, previously head of the European Students' Union, and she really is a true European, uh, Swedish by birth, grew up in Italy, educated in Scotland, and lives in Belgium. So. Welcome, Anne. And last but not least, many of you know her, Patricia Heidegger, who is Director of Global Policies and Sustainability at EEB, a real advocate for global justice. And before she joined EEB, she was the Executive Director of an NGO Coalition on Sustainability. So welcome, everybody, for our last... Uh, panel. So I'll, I'm going to start with Laura because uh, the Minister for Ecological Transition wanted to be with us but couldn't be and uh, that's Teresa Rivera Rodriguez. So perhaps Laura, I know that you've got a statement uh, from the Minister that you would like to read out. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Good uh, afternoon to everybody. And yes, my minister wanted to be here and she is sending you this uh, uh, brief message to the European Environmental Bureau. I would have liked to be with you today and although the ministerial agenda is complicated and I cannot make it, I did not want to miss the opportunity to send you a brief message. As a minister for the ecological transition, I'm part of a government that is determined to work for a more united and a stronger Europe that puts the people's prosperity and respect for environmental limits at the center of its policies. We believe that the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is an opportunity for Europe and for its economic competitiveness. The continuous alerts and calls for actions of the scientific community about the fragility of the ecological balance of the planet force us to adopt measures that facilitate a rapid change, a rapid change in the economic system and the development model. It is time to promote decisions that allow us to address the challenge of a globalized and interdependent economy with limited natural resources and with the aim to provide prosperity for all. We are determined to promote this change at the national level. But at the same time, we will be a government that contributes as a member state to set sufficiently ambitious objectives for the European Union, appropriate to the scale of what is needed. As I said, I'm part of a, of a government that believes in Europe, 
a government which acknowledges that in recent decades, environmental and climate change policies have been a key builder of a European identity, making them increasingly compatible with other European values, such as social justice and economic progress is the best recipe for the future of Europe. For this work of environmental progress and the building of the Europe we want, I would like to thank the European Environmental Bureau and all the organizations that conform it for the hard work. Count on our determined commitment to work together in this transition. Thank you very, very much uh, for reading for that statement from the Minister for Ecological Transition. And in fact, Laura does bring us some good news. I wouldn't want to do the cliche of a ray of Spanish sunshine, but I've said it now. So uh, some of you will have read the headlines, which we even got into the British press and the Guardian uh, last week, which was that uh, the new government has announced an agreement with trade unions to close down many of the mines in uh, Spain, as I understand it. And it's been welcomed by the unions as uh, very fair and as a just transition. Uh, there has been reskilling opportunities, uh, environment restoration, and retirement for some of the miners. Um, so, Laura, please tell us a little bit more about that. Well, um, this is a very recent government. Um, we arrived to, to the government in, in June, and there was two pressing um, issues for our ministry. The first one is that the energy transition in Spain has been frozen for a few years now, but also all the socio-economic work that has to come together with this energy transition was frozen too. So we had to face in the short term the, um, the closure of many, well, the majority of the mines will close by the end of the year due to European regulation related with the state aid, uh, Council Decision 787. So we had like three different options. One, that it was what, very much um, uh, actors and, and, and regional governments and local authorities and unions expected from us that it was like given I look to this European legislation trying to make some flexible arrangements to maintain uh, some of the mines. The second, it was to close down the mines without an agreement. And the third one is taking a little bit uh, the, the only approach that we, we, we thought we could make, that it was respecting uh, European Union uh, legislation and at the same time bringing people on board and discussing with unions how can we be both closing uh, the mines and at the same time sending a message of hope for workers and communities. The coal conversion, I mean, the structural adjustments in regions have been going on now for decades. We had 40, 45,000 miners in the 90s and now we had only 3,000 people if we were counting direct jobs in the, in the, in the coal uh, mines and subcontractors. But despite that the numbers were um, uh, really small, the truth is that for some communities that was the only thing that was left. Because in this long reconversion, well, uh, opportunities have come many times, but others uh, results have been uh, not so um, easily perceived. Opportunities have not most of the times been close to the places and to the municipalities where they were losing uh, jobs. And at the same time, this happened inside this big economic crisis of Spain. So uh, the jobs that were lost have, had, uh, had better, for instance, working conditions than the new jobs. The, um, some of the projects that were incentivized in these communities failed because of the economic crisis. I mean, many other businesses were failing all over Spain. So people have lost, had lost faith in well, in, in, in the transition. It's like, well, come on, maintain my job is what I have now, or maintain my company is what I have now. I think it is not that the time to, uh, to move. And I think we, we really have to, to, to be grateful to the unions and to the employers to come to this agreement that uh, uh, give answers to workers, as you said, social protection uh, measures. Uh, social protection is never, uh, uh, I mean, it is never uh, so much discussed on environmental discussions, but it is the key 
of the European uh, model, and it is the key uh, element for making transition acceptable. So we have this with these social protection tools, early retirement, but also um, uh, well, uh, compensation payments for the young uh, minors, and leaving no one behind. That was a part of the of the agreement. But another part of the agreement, and also working with subcontractors, or how can we involve them in reskilling, in in being part of the restoration, the environmental restoration that has to take place. But, but also we need to come with uh, kind of uh, an urgent uh, plans because if we lose the employment in 2019, we lose employment. People will leave the villages and they will not return. So we have uh, also agreed to come with, with two plans in short term. One is environmental restoration. It, it was kind of important because many of the mines were in creditors meeting or liquidation, so they could not undertake the restoration uh, tasks that they had to. So the state came to the rescue and provide funds for that. And also uh, an urgent plan for um, energy efficiency and renewable energies, above all looking at the um, uh, initiatives that can, can be more um, uh, job intensive, like for instance, envelope uh, building, and, and, and also well, self-consumption in, in, in buildings. At the same time, we said that this wasn't going to be a short-term a short commitment. So we were going to start another kind of, of uh, work that we did not uh, do before, that was working in just transition contracts with the communities. So at the same time that we kind of uh, maintain jobs in the short term, we want to engage with communities in another discussion, a long-term discussion, thinking of long-term jobs, thinking of smart specialization of the regions, what the, in a realistic approach, in the socioeconomic context, with the uh, skills of the labor force. And, um, and for that, what we are um, offering to the, to the communities is, um, of course, funding, but also provide more agile access to existing tools that we can have in the Ministry of Industry or in the Ministry of um, Economy. So we want to support that, um, that work that has to be in a much more uh, participatory approach. We want communities to discuss and to come up with the idea of what do you want to be in the future? What do you want, how do you want to earn your living in the future? And of course, green technologies and... and so it's the whole package. Uh, it's the whole package, really yes. It's workers it. first, second, it was like kind of very early plans to maintain employment in the short term and then having another conversation, thinking of long, medium and long term for those uh, communities that will need more time because we wanted to make it more participatory, mm -hmm. more landed mm -hmm. on the... On the different so you're context. combining, of course, all of the dimensions of social development there. It's about workers, it's about communities, it's about the in, in environment. Montserrat, can I ask you, you, you would welcome such a just, just transition, I would imagine, and do you think that it can be applied uh, to your uh, situation to the ETUC? Yes, when, uh, <laughs> when I was, uh, when I was uh, quoted here, I was in the a Guardian, I was returning from Italy to present, uh, I was invited to an uh, industrial area that the unions have organized a meeting to, to also to involve trade unions in this transformation. It was an area full of uh, steel uh, industries in Umbria. And I have been there, led me to promotion our guide, presenting the guide on how to involve trade unions in climate action to build the chance transition. I was really impressed because uh, to be interviewed by the Guardian that happens uh, very often as a, for, for a trade unionist. And for me, when he asked me uh, where, which you consider were the, the, key, the, key, the key parts of this agreement or the main uh, importance for you, I say first, as a trade unionist, because it's an agreement. And that for us, to negotiate an agreement with a counterpart, employers, the governments, is always a challenge. And if at the end we achieve, if we, we have a good result, that's good. And also because, as Laura have said, it's the first time that the government takes the responsibility to tell the truth to the miners, because in our country it was a long, long-term agony that miners come to Madrid with big demonstrations, again, 
subventions, European funds. It was the first time that a government tell the truth to the miners. So you think that you might be able to apply it not only just to Spain, but to other contexts in Europe? Yes, yes, it's, it's what I have Those said. It's, it's a good yeah. example. It's a good example because it's an agreement, because it promotes uh, a reskilling of the, the workforce, because it promotes uh, and includes also uh, social protection instrument and tools. Uh, and also promotes a long-term reorganization of the of the region of the landscape where the the, the the mines are, and for that reason, I have answered. I consider a good agreement that could be exported because we have been working on that on the problem of regions and coal in our previous uh, in a previous uh, project, and we have seen that in Poland, Bulgaria, in other parts in other regions of Europe, they say yes. But what happens next? What is the what happens when the mine closes and I will not have a job here or near here? I need to move to Germany. I need to move to another country. I want a job. I want I want to tell my my children, okay, that's it. that's the end. It's a tradition that uh, ends. But now we have the opportunity because we have a new industry on renewables, or we have a new industry close to us uh, that uh, uh, avoids that this uh, landscape, this region is abandoned by the citizens. Sure. That, that also creates a big problem because all people uh, went to the cities to work. No? For that reason, we welcome the agreement. I have said to the Guardian that I was not uh, part of the, negotiator, <laughs> the negotiators, but I have told that, of course, for a trade union organization like us. And uh, the proof is that now our colleagues from Poland are asking us, can we contact the people who negotiate the agreement from the unions because we want to learn about how they have done. Huh? Understood. I mean, of course, traditionally, the unions, the priority has always been uh, jobs um, as, as part of uh, perhaps the so sustainable development dimension. But what about, um, you know, how ready are you to really embrace the environmental dimension of sustainable uh, development? I think uh, from the old time, even before that I arrived, of course, to the ETUC, the environmental dimension was key but always linked to jobs because we are a trade union and we are defending the rights of our workers to have a job, to transform their jobs. But of course, for us, the just transition is a precondition to increase the ambition because we are listening all the time. We need to have m more ambition, but of course, with a regulated uh, procedure, we need to see that we cannot let the abandon the social dimension. This decarbonization process has an impact on citizens, on communities, on jobs. And we need to confront this transformation. And we as the trade unions, we are leading this transformation. And that was one of the missions of this uh, project, was when we learned that not all workers were aware of the future, immediate future, and the emergency, we have decided to, to train, to begin to, to uh, capacitate them to play a key role at national level, at regional level. Thank you very much. Now let me bring uh, the uh, employers into the conversation, Jan. And uh, we're talking about transformation, we're talking about social change. I mean, how do you make, you make your members, how do you make these companies um, accountable to social change? Thank you. Um, you. You speak about companies and enterprises. It's now for more than 20 years that I am dealing with them, but not with enterprises or companies. And I think that's what I want to bring here today. We, we work daily with men and women in enterprises. And that makes the whole difference. This kind of ghosts, companies, legal institutions, yeah, I work with people that like me, like you, I guess, are lovers, parents, consumers, uh, carers, and that most of them that I have been working with for the last 20 years wants to give some meaning to their lives. Um, and like you, like me, they have high concerns in the morning if they have to wake up and first check if kids will be in the playground outside or stay inside. So that is um, already an approach whereby we then try to tap into their rational intelligence but also their emotional and spiritual intelligence. And how do you do that? Well, 
by creating a zone where there is a license for being creative, to augment your empathy and intelligence in connecting with civil society, with policy makers, those who are also on this journey of transformation. For me, the transformation of business is as much as the transformation of civil society and NGOs. So we, can you give us an example of this yeah. sort of transformation that you're seeing? Yes. So, for instance, if, if, if we would be around a table, I, I would like to have maybe a tire here and a tomato on the table and have a discussion between a tire and a tomato. We try to convey a space on duration where we have men and women from a company that is making tires with the automotive, using tires, with road makers, with water utilities, and with people from the agriculture um, industry mm -hmm. and food. Why? Because today, the complexity of environmental social issues, and it was very well illustrated by, by this Spanish example, ask you much more complexity in the intelligence you need around the table for more complex solutions. Nano plastic particles from tires on the roads, especially even more tomorrow with electric cars that are heavier and break even more um, brutally, uh, these nanoparticles get out of the roads, water are being cleaned, and the mud that is staying there is used as fertilizers on land. Yeah. But explain to a tire company that he or she needs to sit around the table with these different stakeholders, yeah, that's already a kind of revolution saying, no, 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 no that's not me. That's but you've done this with so, Bridgestone or Pirelli or whoever the tire exactly. company is. So that are. is the kind of things we are doing. What we are also doing, and that is, I think, something that is very important to understand. These international or national conventions, regulations, frameworks, as we call them, what is critical is to understand that not a single manager in HR, in purchase, in maybe in legal affairs, but in all these functions, they don't have any, any copy of the ILO convention on on the UN guiding principles of human rights. So you make this simple for these yes. men and women translate. in these companies. We you translate. What is very conceptual. And, but you translate, but do they actually adhere? So, translation is one. It needs to be even in the language of a function. And then you have to use that language into creating or transforming management systems and processes. That is what they work daily with. You can also transform them in measurable, even in KPIs. Although on KPIs, I have my concerns. I think that one source of burnouts today is that we don't have only yearly, monthly KPIs, but it's almost weekly and daily. We recreate roles among colleagues in, 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 in one same organization. But having said that aside, translation and building the modern management systems and process of today that is what our organization is about. And can you give us an example of where you actually have succeeded? Yes, so uh, on, on the business and human rights, which I was quoting, um, we are developing with civil society, Friends of the Earth was present, policy makers, trade unions, uh, and companies and other experts. Uh, we have been building new grievance mechanism that you install within a company, especially in countries where you don't have uh, the rule of law fully and, and justice systems fully equipped and that is being used by a number of, of, of companies. We also um, develop all kinds of other mechanisms that are being used by boards of, of companies to help them to assess and translate sometimes in numbers. You know that speaking to companies about oh there is a problem about skills gaps, they all cry and complain since 20 years we have X millions of unemployed young people and needs, not in employment, not in training. Well, how do you articulate a language that brings the classroom in the boardroom so that they discuss strategically and can set strategic targets? You need to build a narrative. It was mentioned, a business case. 
but that is taking a cultural shift in minds. Understood. Anna, let's bring you into the conversation now. Now, we all know that young people, especially in the gig economy, the zero hours economy, they're very, very concerned about uh, skills, education, and jobs. So how high on their agenda is an issue such as sustainable development? Um, well, sustainable development concerns everyone, uh, but young people and youth organization really have a unique role to play uh, in the move towards a more sustainable future both as agents for change, but also as rights holders in the change process. Uh, to answer the question of where is it on the agenda for young people, it's very high. It's often in most countries among the top three um, concerns that young people have. So it is remarkable for uh, young people to see that no matter what the ask and the fact that young people are very concerned and think that it is something that truly know that it will affect their future and already see the effects in their daily life that um, governments, politicians do not actually act now and, and make the changes that are necessary. I mean, isn't the one thing though to be high on their awareness, but does that actually translate into a change of behavior? Um, you know, we know young people, uh, everybody buys uh, fast fashion from H&M and Primark, and even after the Rana Plaza f fire, everybody was gonna, now we're gonna buy sustainable fashion, but uh, do they actually change their consumption uh, patterns? They, they're aware, but do they actually change? And well, how do you make them change? Well, firstly, um, I think, uh, I mean, I'd say that young people are not a homogenous group. Uh, they are from all different types of uh, uh, so, well, socioeconomic backgrounds. They come from uh, all just parts of societies, all sorts of gender identification. So grouping young people as one, that is simply not possible. Uh, but I'd like to say that, I mean, young people and not just in Europe, but in the world, are the generation, we are the generation that we're going to bear the brunt of uh, the decisions that have made, been made for us and what the consequences of climate change uh, and our sustainable models actually um, well, will bring. Um, and for young people, as you said, I mean, climate change is a matter of fact and we are very aware that we're running out of time. Um, so you raise awareness, that, uh, but I'm just wondering, what are you doing? What are you doing to actually pro prom promote and galvanize uh, young, young people to well, change their behaviors? <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's many young youth organizations are uh, an incredible driving force when it comes to actually um, working with young people in terms of working on sustainable development and actually working on climate change. But it's actually uh, more than trying to not just changing young people themselves, but actually changing the system. So we need to, young people have to be part and part, participate in the process of actually making that change. So um, participating in decision making processes is as part of our rights, but it's not actually something that is guaranteed when it comes to climate change. And that actually does need to change because if young people were part of the decision making process and actually were at the table where the decision making pla taking place, most probably different decisions would be, ba be taken because young people actually already accept that climate change is a fact and that we do need to act now. When it comes to changing consumer trends, actually young people have been at the forefront of uh, driving um, consumer trends such as buying more local, uh, buying more sustainable goods, free trade, all these kind of fair trade, all these kind of issues, young people have been at the forefront of uh, making sure that that is changed to happen and maybe boycotting good doing protests. If you look at uh, young people, it's true, have lost trust in governments at the moment and in our institutions. Uh, and a lot of people accuse, and I hear this all the time as Secretary General of the European Youth Forum, that uh, young people are apathetic, young people don't care. Um, However, the Youth Forum has done a study, and if you look at participation in terms of voting trends, that may be true. But it is not true if you look in terms of actually more movements and ideological things. Young people participate a lot. They participate more than other generations, be it in, um, 
in actually being part of organizations or uh, in a campaign, participate on online, being part of debates. Young people participate incredibly actively, and this is very important. One, another part that needs to happen is changing frameworks, changing uh, technologies is only one part of the equation, but we do also need to change the way we act, and that needs to happen through education. So education is also key in this, and citizenship education, where sustainable development is a key part of that, needs to happen. Where again, young youth organizations learning from one another, bringing formal non-formal education, so actually doing activities themselves with each other, uh, are part of the forefront of actually bringing, making this a reality and uh, teaching other young people of how do we live in a sustainable world. Thank you very much. Yes, definitely agents of change, but rights holders who need to be at the table too. Patrizia, your reflections on what you've uh, heard in uh, yes trying to move uh, and accelerate this transition to a sustainable future. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to um, acknowledge or let me say how happy, happy I am about the, the diversity of this panel. Uh, the idea here was to discuss with very diverse stakeholders about the common ground that we have already identified to move or to accelerate towards the transition that is needed. And obviously our role as the EB and as a kind of crucial part of the environmental movement is to defend environmental policies, but at the same time, of course, we and everybody, everybody needs to step out of their own bubble and interact with other key stakeholders and identify that common ground and to have more impact. And I mean, a good news is that we have already identified a lot of common ground. So I mean, with the, the European Youth Forum and each of work together in SDG Watch Europe to push for a, you know more ambitious implementation of the uh, SDGs in the EU. With CSR Europe, we have uh, built a, a, a good partnership in, in the multi-stakeholder platform and the implementation of the SDGs. So that framework of sustainable development has already helped us as civil society to kind of step out of our own silos a bit and to do what we ask governments to do. So that, that's the good news. But what's um, missing? Well, yeah, at the same time, I think we still face some challenges in developing that joint narrative to what does it actually take for a sustainable future. And I think there's a, a job for all of us to be done to kind of come beyond these challenges and have a more, I mean, a joint message, a strong message and to work together. So, I mean, just to kind of put a couple of challenges on the table and then maybe we can also see with the audience uh, what, what, what are the challenges that they see. But, um, I mean, for instance, looking at the example from, from Spain, it would be interesting to hear, I understand that this is part of a bigger transition plan. And you said yourself that um, the coal mines were kind of, kind of the low-hanging fruit given that for, you know, reasons of legislation, they were already kind of not economy viable anymore. Um, but what about, let's say, more crucial parts of, of the, the Spanish economy that are not sustainable? I mean, just looking at um, intensive farming um, with high use of pesticides and uh, high use of plastics, all subsidized through, through the European Union. I mean, how do you approach these more crucial sectors where you have much more people employed, they're much more crucial to, to let's say, the, the, the the, the, the state of, of, of your economy. So Patricia, let me just stop yeah. you there because let's get that uh, view on the fact. Coal mining, fine, but how can you apply this to other industries, other extractive industries or intensive agricultural production? Well, yes, <clears throat> one of the four priorities of this government, it is, and we have important priorities like the uh, climate change and energy law that uh, we do not have such a law in Spain and we have to, to come in the, in the, in the next uh, weeks with launching that, that project. Well, one of the priorities is having a, a, a national uh, just transition strategy. And that, as you said, is, a much, um, is thinking economy-wise for the whole economy, all regions, all sectors, how are we going if we want to um, kind of lead as the Ministry for Ecological Transition, we have to uh, have the social and economic part on board. And it means really to try to anticipate policies and to think also on environmental regulations, having in mind what impact is going to have on jobs and companies, sometimes that impact has to happen. I mean, there are sectors that has, have, to be, have, have to disappear. It is not blocking the change. It is anticipating the effect. It has to be done, and it can be done properly. So what we are doing is um, we have started a, well, we started a, a dialogue with the different uh, ministries that had a um, mandate on industry, economics, um, uh, labor, 
very important. So um, we are coming up with this strategy that aims to first to know better the impacts on employment. That is something that we don't know. Basically, all governments have uh, information that comes from those sectors that do not want to disappear or sectors that want to, but we don't have official data many times of the opportunity. So first that. Second, how are we going to help important sectors of our economy both to readapting to the environmental limits and also to adapting to climate change impacts, for example. And we have tourism, we have agriculture, that is very important. We have, we have fishing. I mean, we have to make this um, uh, transition much more informed, much more transparent <coughs> in decision making and um, uh, making a better use of the instruments that we already have and that many times at the um, governmental level are not coordinating. And we have to hear more. And for instance, we, want, uh, we, we are uh, launching social dialogue tables to have the voices of people around, well, how are we going to plan the energy transition to have the best impacts on jobs and economy? How are we going to plan mobility, the mobility of the future? And that is very important for a big, huge sector in, economy, in the Spanish economy as the automotive um, industry. How are we going to move? to a sustainable mobility and have that concern about how are we going to move our industries and all of our sectors into the circular economy. So it's a much broader. It's a much broader uh, strategy and we hope to, to, well, to have the first draft for, um, uh, for social uh, debate and consultation also in the few coming weeks. For us, it was important to launch like the most um, uh, important pieces of regulation together with this strategy. So we have to make a climate change law, or we want to present a climate change law uh, that is ambitious enough. We have to present an, um, a national energy and climate plan to the European Union that is ambition enough, and we have to do that with a third part that is a strategy and just transition to accompany this um, uh, ambitious environmental <coughs> standards. Thank you. Patricia, yes. Other, other concerns that you might have, or challenges that you might have written down when you were hearing our yeah. panellists speak? Maybe let me pick one and then we can see what other people yeah, think. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, Jan. <laughs> um, it would be interesting to hear um, more about your association's position on more or stronger regulation of corporate accountability. Um, I mean, we've seen a lot of kind of quite a transformation over the last years about this discourse. There's a couple of new laws in, in member states, but also at the European level that, um, that establish uh, due diligence for uh, global supply chains. There is certain regulation on sectors, conflict mining, uh, conflict uh, minerals, or illegal logging that is kind of patchy. And um, there's a bigger debate about more general due diligence uh, legislation for negative environmental impact and, and human rights violations, or also more sector-specific regulation to really hold corporate um, co um, uh, companies accountable. Um, and it would be interesting to hear a little bit more from your organization, given that in the SDG context there's a tendency to see the SDGs as something, I mean, they're legally non-binding, um, which is nice because it allows everybody to join the club, but at the same time there's the danger of basically taking a step back and forgetting about you know, how advanced we already are with, 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 with regulation that we should actually go even further and, and to make a link between sustainable development and the need for, for better regulation. So how to make your members more accountable to uh, regulation? Two answers. One, and then we're going to the audience. <laughs> two answers. One, we have chosen our battles. One battle we are engaged in since a long time is the European regulation on corporate transparency and reporting. It has taken many years. Since 1 January 2018, there is full implementation of a European directive on so-called, it's a very stupid name, non-financial information. Imagine you have to define sustainability by non-financial, completely wrong approach. But we have been with civil society, trade unions, and some others among the 10 co-writers of that directive, a smart regulation. 
And we have not stopped there. We are considering what is the total impact of enterprises in society and on society. That is why we are working very hard with, an, with enterprises and civil society on a practical blueprint for companies on tax, on responsible tax behavior and reporting. Because we cannot stand that kind of schizophrenic attitude of companies flagging nice things, saving birds and replanting trees here, while they are the champions of tax avoidance, which is not enabling what local regional governments need to have to do that transition. Can I just ask you, because you have Coca-Cola, Bass, uh, Volkswagen, all amongst your members, and, and how do they view this idea of fair taxation? So, and, and I've used the word schizophrenic. Mm. Most of our members are schizophrenic. <laughs> so, uh, where uh, you have colleagues doing in the right hand what is being contradicted by colleagues in, in the left hand. So, but I know many governments where there is a lot of schizophrenia, and I know a lot of civil society organizations where there's also that dimension. So, they don't have that monopoly. We are human beings, and organizations are very complex. So, um, we have companies that are very much engaging with us that are asking to have non-meetings, non-meetings with high policy makers, while at the same time, colleagues of the same organization is continuing the classic way towards classic lobby, let's call it that way. I will not name any other organizations. But they play on the two sides. Now, having said that, I think that if we want to go in the direction that we have heard, how, as much the social dialogue and social partners belong to the industrial society that is in transition. <coughs> it is time to equip Europe at all levels, but also at European level. We need to have, on top of it, or besides the social dialogue, a sustainability dialogue. The issues are too complex for two partners to deal with that. So that is something that we have tested in a few months with a so-called EU SDG platform or whatever, a kind of animal that was with European youth, with the Environmental Bureau, with the trade unions, with Business Europe, with CESA Europe, with and 30 uh, big stake organizations that have entered what I call this new arc and to reinvent the way we can um, better live together and, and respecting the boundaries. Huh? So that is a place where we will have to fight and have joy in thinking what are the next smart regulations. And a regulation is only smart, I'm a lawyer by the way, a regulation is only smart if you go deeper on the, on the cappuccino you know the foam? Mm, delicious. Go deep in the cappuccino. That's what I call the capacity building. Without that, you are not respecting your own job of fighting for new legislation. If you don't fight for that, then I take you accountable of not being a complete responsible civil society organization. Understood, but I don't think you haven't quite answered my question on Coca-Cola, so let me just come back on to, I mean, the companies like Coca-Cola and Bass and uh, Volkswagen, uh, well known for Dieselgate, I mean, are they actually supporting better regulation, more regulation for protecting the environment and human health, or are they lobbying against it? I mean, how can you move them into the area of, uh, you know, protecting the environment and human health? To help me in un addressing <laughs> your question, I use often the image, also when, okay. from time to time, I, 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 I teach. <clears throat> Do you, we are dealing with managed Vaders and managed Jedis. And a Jedi can become a Vader and vice versa. So we are working with organizations that has this double, if sometimes not triple, approach. Being with organizations that fight against, very conservative, 
being in organizations like ours, which is very proactive, going in non-meeting saying, speed up, but I cannot say this vocally, loudly, because there is a culture where these organizations or companies cannot say it in front of their big parents, employees federations, it's like that. I have so many examples where this kind of schizophrenic organizations play the three levels. And I must say, it's a reality of life. And we try to enhance and accelerate and magnify that Jedi element in an organization. <laughs> Sorry to use that image, but I cannot find it. Okay, you're fighting for the uh, uh, Jedi. And let me go to the audience here. Um, we have uh, about 15 minutes, and I'm sure you'd like to ask some more pointed uh, questions to uh, Jan, uh, to Montserrat, uh, to Anna, indeed, on the role of young people as rights holders, which I think is very important in getting them at the table, and perhaps with Laura, too, and the Just Transition, and Patrizia, with the overview. We don't seem to be using, I don't think we're using Slido at the moment, so I think we've gone back to the old-fashioned uh, hands up in the, uh, hands up in the uh, room. From what you've heard from these progressive uh, voices, yes, please. Thanks. Jeremy Waits, Secretary General of the EEB. Um, Jan, you're, you've been a bit under the spotlight and I want to keep you there a bit longer because, I mean, one of the issues that business often brings up is the, the fear of loss of competitivity. If, we go, if we're too ambitious with our sustainability uh, goals and our efforts, uh, then we're going to lose competitivity. And I think most people in the sort of sustainability discourse say, well, that's, that's a bad argument because if we innovate towards sustainability, we'll have a competitive advantage. But there is a question about the difference between a long-term competitive advantage by positioning yourself in a low-carbon economy and the short-term impacts, and also just how much you turn up the dial of ambition. Is there a point when you get offshore islands? I hope it won't be an offshore United Kingdom in, in a sort of deregulated zone, which could get a competitive advantage by basically cheating on its obligations to, to the planet. Um, and so how is, how is that discussed uh, among your members? And I'd also be interested in the, the other panelists' views on that issue of competitivity, because do, I sometimes feel that the EU is missing an opportunity with its huge power as, a, as the largest single market in the world to be, flex its muscles a bit more in, in introducing sustainability as, a, as an issue in trading, uh, trade negotiations. So I'm kind of suggesting one kind of answer, but you might have other kinds of answers. Thank you. Jan, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, and it's part of the dialogue we have continuously with the EU authorities. It's to have a balanced approach towards sustainability or what we call today the SDGs by emphasizing a lot about compliance, be accountable, including towards smart regulation, but don't, not, but don't wait for Godot of having the perfect regulation out there. You are accountable to your stakeholders, including your workers, employees, consumers, and so forth, but also to your shareholders. And we try to work with enterprises where management, top management, is working hard to get a deal with a minority and their shareholders, General Assembly, to give a license for medium long-term investment. Those companies who are entering new markets of inclusive growth, you know maybe the, the, the enterprises that are investing in what we call at, at the bottom of the pyramid, markets with uh, consumers that have 1.5 or 2 or 3 dollars a day and who are working with civil society like health to get a business model that make that sustainable. They cannot do that if there is not a minority in the shareholder PA that gives a license to do that because it's an investment up to, for, for 10, 15 years before you become break even because the externalities of it cost quite a lot. But they see this as 
using social innovation, is it now environmental or people, as a driver for inclusive and sustainable growth, for progress. So that is the kind of, meet, the, the, of enterprises we have these kind of discussions and we have what we call stakeholder dialogues where top management and, 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 and middle management come together with stakeholders and where they create new products, new business. Is it in the north of France, difficult area, or is it in Colombia or other areas? There are new business models. The social entrepreneurs, we in CISA Europe, working with large companies, we reinstall um, social intrapreneurship in companies. I meet too much bureaucrats in companies, by the way, that are being trained, old-fashioned frameworks of business models, and that's another piece of debate, how uh, the environmental bureau and the other ones are going to invest in changing curriculum. That is not at the right speed for the moment, but it's another debate. But so, that business case, that opportunity element of the SDGs is out there. And my experience in the multi-stakeholder platform is that I had the impression that by giving a number about there is estimation of how these SDGs is creating a new market of opportunities, I had the impression that this was almost coming with pornography. Putting a number, dollars or euros, associated to an SDG. It is not. It is not. When I can show, or when companies can show, that by investing, for instance, in youth, you know that when a young boy or girl, middle um, teenagers, interact four times with quality, with the world of work, is it public work, private, or whatever, but with the world of work, he or she has five times less risk to become not in employment or in education. Yeah, but these numbers tell you what is the business case. And if you can tell to a company, stop recruiting over-graduated people, it's a complete disease in, in most of the big and uh, large companies, but invest in quality vocational education. Make, help to make it an equal choice in Europe, not just Germany, Switzerland, Austria, always the same countries. That is massive investment for massive return on investment. We also calculate what it costs to invest in well-being and mental health at work. For one euro investment, six in return. It's maybe not this kind of returns with two numbers, but it is sufficient to say it's sustainable to be more radical in innovating, transforming your HR management systems. It is also on bloody difficult elements like mental health. Jeremy, did you get an answer? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I did get an answer to something, but I don't know if it was quite the question I asked, but I, I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe I to give the other, the other panelists might, might also have a view on it. The truth is that there has not been uh, any analysis in, in these last decades that environmental regulation has been bad for European businesses' competitiveness, on the contrary. So we have gained competitivity due to environmental regulations. It has raised innovation, it has raised um, productivity, it has raised jobs. And that is what every study uh, shows. <laughs> The problem is that, um, and, and the truth is that the opposite, I mean delaying the action and delaying or trying to not wait a little bit in order to protect what industry has not been uh, useful at all. And we have a case of the car industry in Europe. We have been delaying or trying to smooth regulation because of course it's a very important industry and the change is going to arrive. And the change is going to arrive anyways and it's going to we are going to be more or less prepared and our industry is going to be more or less in fit to fulfill with this new world. And the truth is that delaying that environmental regulation has been an incredible irresponsibility for, uh, uh, for, for jobs and for industry in Europe. And it, it, so that is sometimes when, we, when I hear these events, it's like, well, but then reality 
comes. And the truth is that the lay in action has not provided more jobs, has not provided better businesses, but being the leaders have brought European businesses to new markets, have been leading in many uh, markets. And the world is coming more and more complicated, unfortunately, for many uh, regulations. But I think even in that complicated uh, space where well, we have many governments that are not very much for um, a sustainable development approach to globalization. Despite that, I think for Europe it's still the case. I mean, it's still the economic case to follow that path. Otherwise, we have not that much more to, to compete with, with others. But well, that is my... Yes, I want to add that uh, I agree with what Laura says, but uh, when uh, Jemmy uh, remarks that will be relevant, will be essential to include social and environment clauses to the trade agreements, because this is the key element. We have demanded that as a trade unions, as a, you know, we are building alliances also with environmental organizations, we have demanded intensity within, with a lot of intensity, but at the moment that is not happening, but will be key. Because if not, will happen with recently happened in France, where fantastic, a big calm of solar power uh, calm, one of the biggest of Europe, at the same time, uh, French industry of production of solar uh, goods close, because the majority were buy it in China with different standards, different uh, situation. For that reason, we are asking that for us, transition means also good social protection, good jobs, good social dialogue, collective agreements, collective bargaining, because like this, we, we, we can have that. Of course, we need to, to demand the same standards, because if not, we are playing a very double game, no? We are saying, oh, okay, we want electric cars. I have been involved in this discussion of the clean energy package. Uh, of course, we want an, uh, electric cars, but the majority of our companies, your affiliates, by the way, <laughs> are investing 25 more times in China than in Europe. That is not to be too much European, on our opinion. Because, of course, we'll be less jobs in Europe. At the same time, Laura mentioned sectors that needs to anticipate. By the way, anticipation is the word that we are telling all the time to the Commission, to the governments when we meet them. But it's not the case because there is a sector that is immediate, immediate because needs not anticipation, needs now to have prepared people is the construction sector. Paris Agreement recommends to rebuild the majority of the houses that we have in Europe, but no one is preparing this workforce for to be to play the role that we need, agriculture, transport. And we are, we are trying to prepare our members for to play the role at national <laughs> level, because at European level we have a scope, but our members have also a role to play at national level. And this is, this is the important, because our next step will be to enter in the adaptation, because Paris Agreement is now, but the ambition needs to be implemented in actions, and very, very fast. And we are mm, watching that uh, is not the case in uh, all uh, European countries. Another question from the audience. Yes, please. The, is that a gentleman at the back? You're hidden from me. So please, tell me your name, your organization, and who you would like to answer your question. I'm Andre Savage from Ukraine Society and Environment. Um, and my question is to Anna about youth. We just this year did a survey in my home country about the environmental values and attitudes of the citizens. And one of the big surprises to us was the fact that the age is not a differentiating factor. There is not that much difference between what the older or younger people think about the environment or what they are concerned about. So we looked at the surveys inside the EU about the same issue. They are available, um, periodic surveys, and this is the uh, the problem is that it's the same here. Inside the EU, the age is not a major differentiating factor for most of the uh, issues that you would consider studying when trying to understand whether people are concerned about environmental protection, whether they're concerned about the climate change, and on some issues even the older people are more concerned, like agricultural pollution, for example. Question, do you think the youth is ready 
to be the uh, ambassadors for sustainable Europe or something more needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, I think that it depends kind of what issue and what you're looking into when it comes to, let's say, the cl climate change agenda. Uh, for sure, agriculture, uh, that is something that um, less young people will be engaged with than uh, uh, other factors. Um, one study that we did quite recently uh, in, within the European Youth Forum, we asked most of our members, so youth organisations, what we were asking them what did their members work on when it came to the sustainable development goals and what, what, do, what difference did it make? But we quickly realised that we had to actually change the question. We couldn't frame it in a way, we had to change it so into how um, asking exactly what they're working on and then we had to make the translation where does that fit in and then actually we saw that they really work a lot on different climate change issues, sustainable development issues but it's not maybe perceived that way by themselves because they're simply trying to be active global citizens and work on issues that they care about. So it's also sometimes how is the question framed and what, uh, how are you, uh, how are you putting that in a, to a young person so that they understand how it affects their life. And if you're asking someone, of course, that is active and uh, you know on European level or even on national level, they probably will know the narratives. But if you start going down to grassroots level, they don't. So you actually need to change and disconstruct it much more, and then have it. so it takes a lot more time and resources to do that kind of uh, survey. Um, actually, I also wanted to answer a bit the question of before because I didn't quite get the chance uh, that. I couldn't agree more with, with uh, Jeremy that we are definitely missing an opportunity uh, in not putting, highlighting more on uh, uh, introducing social and sustainability uh, as part of kind of uh, trading agreements. And one thing that uh, the European Youth Forum is very much asking for is that Europe uh, and the EU becomes a global leader when it comes to sustainability. There is currently a bit of a vacuum on the global stage where actually Europe can step it up and needs to be a lot more ambitious in not only its targets but also in being that global leader in pushing for change and uh, um, not only putting the policies and the regulations in place but also being that uh, incubator of innovative solutions that actually brings the solutions to the table and shows this you know this is how we can and this is being competitive, this is preparing for the future. Uh, and this is not happening at the pace it should be. Thank you very much, Anna. Any more questions in the audience? He, is there a sort of gentleman who was thinking about raising his hand but then decided against it? <laughs> OK. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, if you could give me your, uh, your name, your title, and who you, your question, and who you'd like to answer it. Uh, my name is Petro. I'm uh, coming from Moldova, Ecotiras Network, uh, Future Parks Organization, NGO. Uh, my question is to Jan, and uh, it will be very simple. How can NGOs collaborate with corporations on the level of uh, social responsibility and not greenwashing? Thank you. Yes. How do they make sure that they're not greenwashed when they collaborate with Coca-Cola? <laughs> My next WWF background. Absolutely, but I will remember the good times of Coca-Cola accepting to be attacked while the engineers of Coca-Cola and engineers of Greenpeace were working together in five continents to repair thousands of fridges that had negative impact on climate. So uh, again, the schizophrenia of being attacked while cooperating, that's the new society. And don't give up on your battles, but please be a partner of co-action and co-solutions because being just in the street, barking, which is great, it's very healthy, by the way, but you have to change and equip your staff and teams with engineers, with solution-driven people. 
But so, how can you make sure okay. that they're not greenwashed, okay. which I so think was the way, question. The way we are working and setting our standards as CISA Europe is when we organize what we call stakeholder dialogues. We, have, we prepare that for at least seven, eight months within so many different levels in the hierarchy of a company and with different functions depending on the topic. And then we also work a lot with the stakeholders. And we only do that with those companies that commit, not only to us, but to the stakeholders, that after six months of the stakeholder dialogue, normally is bringing change inside the companies, that the company is going back to the stakeholders, including NGOs, to explain what is it that they have been doing with the advice, the expectations, or the intelligence that came from the NGOs into the stakeholder dialogue. But we also go back to the stakeholders and ask them, what is it that you have been doing with that collective intelligence you participated to during a stakeholder dialogue that was prepared eight months before and that continues six months later? It's not in one direction. It cannot be anymore in one direction. A lot, just an example. There was a huge celebration in media by NGOs for having contributed to stop child labor for a very, even more grand, large company like Coca-Cola. We went to these NGOs and said, please, victory will come if you and the company locally, in the regions, in the communities where there was uh, child labor, identified through audits, joint audits, civil society and business auditing together, very innovative. But if you come and negotiate with the mayor about transforming that so-called child labor into quality vocational education where you have work, place, learning and school, that ends with a certificate that is recognized at country level so that this diploma is recognized for employability of the young people. But a company alone, negotiating with a mayor who prefers to have the money from from sanctions, sometimes mayors are much more happy to have to get that money in the pocket. So if a company with an NGO can co-negotiate a solution to the root of the problem, which is poverty, and not just saying, oh, there's no child labor anymore in the supply chain, Shit, they will find work in another more even ugly business. So co-designing solutions, co-fighting for solutions, that is what we need to, 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 to work on, otherwise too easy. And greenwashing, sorry for the greenwashing. I said we ask commitment of companies to go back to the NGOs to justify what they did or not but sometimes with a good justification, with the inputs from the NGOs. By the way, I encourage, since more than 15 years, a lot of companies to even start with greenwashing. I have nothing against them, because I trust the intelligence of civil society to tick on the fingers and maybe to be a partner to make progress towards more true transparency. And transparency is not an end, it's only a means. It's a management uh, process. But so, um, and, and by the way, try by yourself, do a sustainability report on your performance. I can tell you, you will be a much better, better partner for business when you do it yourself. Walk the talk, do your measurement, quality and quantitative of your footprints. And you will find out that you can also improve. But you go through the pain and joy of transparency, including sometimes with greenwashing transparency. I was just wondering whether somebody could tell me whether the Director General of the DG of Environment, Daniel Callien, is he in the room? Yes, lovely. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm aware that uh, your, your time is, uh, is, is precious, and I think we're most probably coming to the end of the question and answer session, unless anybody is desperate to ask a question. No. So, if I just might go back, 
uh, to the panel and I think Anna you really um, summed it up beautifully with your, your question about innovation and incubators but if we do move forward to uh, you know the next uh, the next uh, commission or the next European Parliament I mean what if we start off with Anna do you think uh, should it do give me a, give me a one priority to try to accelerate the green transition well actually puts the um, not just rhetoric but real targets and ambitions and actually the money where where they they talk about it because let's face it the, this commission has not really prioritize sustainable development, so the next commission it needs to, and it has to be much higher on the political agenda. Thank you very much. Laura, yes, one priority for the commission. As you, we know, it wasn't high in the Juncker commission, the next commission, what do you think they need to do, or the European Parliament, to accelerate the green transition? I, I think the approach that brings us the sustainable development goals, it is an excellent mirror for Europe and where we want to go. And that interlinkages of the different spheres, I mean, advancing environment, advancing socially, advancing economically, it, it seems like a very simple thing to do, but it is, anyways, the key of the issue. So I think it, still having that, um, I mean, it's strengthening sustainable development uh, objectives in Europe is key, and it is also kind of the leadership that despite difficulties, only Europe can keep on bringing to the rest of the world. Yeah. Montserrat. I, I have more than one, but one of the first that is necessary to develop the others, I think, is a financial plan. Means the budget, the multi-annual financial budget, and to retake our proposal on the Just Transition Fund. Even we name it, that was a good proposal, adopt, accepted by the Parliament also. And I think also we'll have a good opportunity this year in Poland, because it's in Europe with the COP24. And this time the trade union movement have anticipated proposal that now is in the hands of the Polish uh, presidency. This is the, to dedicate the COP to the just transition. For first time will be revolutionary in Poland. Just transition and decent jobs will be one of the key elements of this COP. And I think that the European Union will play a role to try to convince the other parts of the planet that this jumelage, this this next this link is necessary. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I would then suggest, but we are discussing that for the moment, to have in the so-called European Industry 2030 strategy a sustainability industry roadmap that by 2024 should ensure that every industry sector in Europe is equipped with a strategy of sustainability, with an action plan, setting their targets, having sector and cross-sectoral platforms to incubate the solutions and have a industry sector uh, integrated performance report once every year or two years. That is to secure that we magnify the volume of enterprises to go on board. And it is also a signal to industry sectors that there is much more work beyond classic lobbying. Be a lobbyist, okay. Be an enabler of change, much better. And Patricia. We will need a new commission that um, is serious about policy coherence for sustainable development. Um, I think I would agree with what um, was said earlier this morning um, by Veronica Manfredi, saying that you can find a European policy um, that uh, delivers of any of the, of the SDGs, maybe even on any of the 169 targets. But you can also identify a policy, a European program, uh, a funding program that hampers the realization of any of the, of the SDGs and any of the 169 targets. And we've heard a lot of examples today from uh, the common agricultural policy to weak enforcement on, on reach. Um, we had all the examples. So um, we need a commission that 
finally comes up with an overarching implementation plan of how, with clear targets, we've heard that, that the need for targets, um, how can we actually make sure that all our policies, all the money that we spend, serve sustainable development and long-term objectives. This is completely absent in the current commission and this is what we need from the new one. And it was also discussed early this morning, there's also a particular role to play by the European Parliament, which should act as a watchdog to really monitor, review and push the new commission on sustainable development and not remain in, in the silos with the Envy Committee and DEVE, having some resolutions on sustainable development here and there, but most of the other committees, trade, employment, etc., all kind of um, ignoring the discourse on, on sustainable development and the SDGs. So there's two distinct roles for both these institutions to play and yeah, we're hopeful that they will take up this challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Laura, Montserrat and Jan for your time and your remarks.